Hello. This lecture is meant for the students of B honors course. The topic of discussion is the treatment of Malvoli in William Shakespeare's play Twelfth Night. I have titled this paper as Malvolio Maltreated in William Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. In this lecture, I shall be discussing on the various aspects of the character of Malvolio, his presence in the play from the beginning to the end, and his transformation from a steward in Olivia's household to a person who is thrown out of this house. The characters in comedy are those who are presented in such a way that the spectators are made to laugh at them. Some characters are also there who make us laugh and we laugh with them. But there are also some characters that we are forced to laugh at. The maltreatment of Malvoli in Twelfth Night is based on this conception of a character who is forced to laugh at, who is forced to laugh be an object of ridicule. A tear jerking hilarious farce cannot be called, as William Hazlitt has once said, one of the most delightful of Shakespearean comedies. The play Twelfth Night, usually regarded as a comedy where we have the eternal world of romance and, as Hazlitt pointed out, the most delightful of Shakespearean comedies, cannot be regarded as delightful when we are encountering characters who are made into objects of ridicule. The play ends with a warning by Malvolio where Malvolio says that I will be revenged on the whole pack of you. So a comedy cannot end with such a revenge and the Avenger is thrown out of the house. So those who made fun by exaggerating the follies of characters in the play, they should beware, beware that they won't go scot-free. Malvolio, of course, wears a false mask, mask of pretension. So does everyone in the play. We love to laugh at characters like Malvolio, but we, we dare not laugh at Orsino with the same faults. We dare not laugh at Viola with the same faults or Olivia with the same faults. We also do not laugh at Sir Toby with the same faults. Malvolio, like other characters I mentioned just now, has a dual self. Outwardly, he is rigid and disciplined. Inwardly, he is romantic and a dreamer obsessed with love. We laugh at him because he is trolled, followed, trapped and exposed, not simply for the false pretensions and blunt witted foolery. All is not well for others. They have their cakes and ales and they take these home too. For Melvolio there is, there is just the ill treatment, exile and revenge. Romantic critics of an like William Blake, like Charles Lamb, sympathize with Malvolio. He is also seen as a man more sinned against than sinning, like King Lear. Malvolio is a self-exiled romantic who is turned into a misfit and punished by a society who is intolerant towards him. Indeed, as Eric Segal has pointed out, dark clouds are hovering in the blue sky of Illyria. Extensively from the best of his own past characters and situations, we can say that Malvolio particularly draws our attention to the plight and the circumstances he has been hosted in. 20th century critics often sympathize with Malvolio. J.B. Priestley, for example, saw Malvolio as, I quote, outside the real comic tradition. He is an innovation, Shakespearean innovation. Shakespeare's invention. Modern audiences are more sympathetic towards sympathetic towards Malvolio than they would have been during Shakespeare's time. Priestley wrote, and Malvolio is full of qualities that Shakespeare detested. For William Winter, though Malvolio is the focus of the satire and humor in the play, 
here is a character different from other comic characters of Shakespeare. C. L. Barber wrote that those who sim, those with sympathy for Malvolio, are viewing him from a distorted romantic perspective. He reminded us that Malvolio not only wants to be with Olivia, so he can acquire the title of a count, but also wants something more. He wants to possess the property as well as the lady of the house. So he is an imposter. He is an upstart, according to C.L. Barber. Malvolio in the play is actually trapped by a set of playful tormentors. It is interesting to note that the first commentator of the play, John Manningham, dated 5th February 2nd, 1601, took notice of Olivia as a widow. I quote from Manningham, a widow left under the guardianship of the steward, Malvolio. Manningham also noted, I quote, a good practice in it is to make the steward believe his lady widow was in love with him, unquote. This almost transports Malvolio to the stature of the romantic hero of the play. If he is the focus of the play, why did the play shift in the later production, the focus from Malvolio to other characters like Orsino or Viola? Malvolio is a steward and belongs to a class much lower in degree than Countess Olivia. In 1612 play by John Webster, The Duchess of Malfi, Antonio is a steward with whom the widowed duchess falls in love and secretly marries. There are several indications in the play that Olivia heavily depends on Malvolio and considers him more trustworthy. Those who cannot compete with him hatch conspiracy against him. Sir Toby, a distant kin of Olivia, is treated like a burdensome drunkard by Olivia. Maria is not always preferred by Olivia in her even in her private matters. Remember, she sends the ring to Cesario through Malvolio, not through Maria. Sir Andrew has no edge in this competition in spite of his 3,000 ducats a year and knighthood. Even Feste faces the practical no-nonsense approach of Malvolio. In a drunken state of merrymakers, thus merrymakers abuse Malvolio and Maria who herself is aspiring to marry Sir Toby, hatches a plot to punish Malvolio. They plant a forged letter. As the first reviewer of the play, John Manningham, pointed out, prescribing his gesture in smiling and his apparel, etc. And then he's uh, made to practice, rehearse and follow the letter, making him believe that Actually, the letter is written by this lady, Olivia. And finally, when Olivia sees this man in yellow stockings, cross gartered, she is thrown out. He is thrown out. In 1628, when it was performed at the court for the Candlemas revels, the play was called, I quote, Malvolio, probably because he became the central object of public ridicule. A man belonging to lower class, aspiring to become Count Malvolio in a feudal and monarchical society that did not permit any kind of upward class mobility. Charles I, I talk about the king, the king Charles I wrote Malvolio on the margin of his folio edition where the title Twelfth Night was written. This perhaps indicates that the play was, per was performed with this title during the Caroline period. The Puritans were on the rise during this period and the play was against the orthodoxy of the Puritans. Even Diggs in 1640, much before the closure of the theatres, recorded that, I quote, galleries, boxes are all full to hear Malvolio, that cross gartered gull, indicating that the central subject of the play shifted to the subplot as an expression of aristocratic class snobbery and anti-Puritanism. Malvolio is perhaps the first important Shakespearean character who belongs to the category of the new emerging professional class, the bourgeois, the steward. As Olivia's steward and purse keeper, Malvolio is a professional for whom job and real life aspirations, even love, commingle. His secret love for Olivia, 
is similar to secret love shared by Viola for Orsino, Olivia for Cesario, Maria for Sir Toby, even Feste for we do not know which heroine. Like this expression of the love in public. Malvolio, Malvolio does not. Like other male characters, he does not have the power to express his love in public. He secretly cherishes and even practices his love for Olivia. He has a desire to be Count Malvolio and he cherishes his dreams in spite of his humble class position, waiting for an opportunity to propose Olivia. He offends Feste by calling him a barren fool and tries to wean him out of Olivia's life so that she is no longer fond of this barren rascal. Another professional competing with him, whom he considers as an inferior performer and an ordinary fool. Although he calls Sir Toby as his master, Malvolio has the courage to call him mad. Remember in Act 2, Scene 3, he calls Sir Toby a mad person. The gulling of Malvolio is mainly based on a trick devised by Maria to impress Sir Toby and avenge Olivia's fondness for Malvolio. Malvolio is accused, accused of ill manner, pretensions and bad temper, but he is also a professional who is doing his job diligently. The word Malvolio in Italian is derived from the word Malvoglio, meaning ill-tempered. His name has a wordplay on the name of Viola with the suffix mal, prefix mal added to it. So he is paired with Viola as a counterfoil. While Viola is rewarded at the end, Malvolio is abandoned, punished. In Act 2, Scene 3, Malvolio interrupts the merrymaker and spoils their sport. He intervenes when the night-long revelry crosses the bounds of decorum, shouting, my masters, are you mad? So whereas this Viola is prized, awarded at the end of the play with Duke Orsino, Malvolio, maladjusted Viola in the play, is actually abused and abandoned, sent out of the place, in spite of the request of Orsino to accommodate Malvolio. Malvolio is of course a Puritan among the merrymakers and tricksters. He is Olivia's household steward, who represents not only the anti-flesh asceticism of the allegorical figures of land, but also the very real spread of such attitudes at the time when increasing numbers of Elizabethans were critical of the imperfectly reformed Church of England and were looking to establish a purer form of religion and politics that is cleansed of all the old Catholic practices. Within just three decades of the first performance of Twelfth Night, the Puritan party had made powerful inroads in Parliament. Oliver Cromwell, English Revolution was the upshot, which culminated in the public beheading of the ritualistic Anglican King Charles I in 1649. Ben Jonson satirizes the religious Puritans in the figure of zeal of the land busy in Bartholomew Fair, 1614. It is a hypocritical epicure who speaks a preacher's jargon. He does not have the psychological or social compatibility or complexity of Malvolio, who is described as only sometimes a kind of Puritan. Maria goes on to qualify this epithet. She says about Malvolio, the devil, that devil, a Puritan, that he is, or anything constantly, but a time pleaser, an affectioned ass that can't state without book and utters it by great swarts, the best persuaded of himself so crammed as he thinks with excellences and it is on this ground that he is ridiculed because it is his grounds of faith that all that look on him love him. The attack of, on Malvolio is a familiar comic theme, usually in comedy as Henry Burgesson said that the misfit is attacked. It is the idea of the misfit around which a comedy usually revolves and comedy punishes the misfit, tries to bring the misfit back to its fold. Any one who resists change is a misfit. Malvolio also resists change when the world is the world of merrymakers, of carnival. Malvolio introduces 
the cruelty of discipline. Therefore, the humiliation of a pompous ass who thinks he is better than he is, is of course justified. For the time being only and for pleasing relevance to the play's first audience, he is represented by the word Puritan. In fact, Malvolio was played throughout the 18th century as well as 19th centuries as a self-satisfied Puritan. Robert Bensley began with an air of Spanish loftiness and metamorphosed this character into a maniac, quick sort, quixote figure under the influence of his delusion. A century later, Henry Iving was playing in the same visual style but hinting at the low birth and a sense of inferiority that culminated in the tragic humiliation. He exiled from the letter scene, not with the pompous swaggering strut, but with his face buried in his hands, strangely moved, overwhelmed with a good fortune. So see how the class novel plays here. Olivia's love for Malvolio is interpreted in classist term, as if Malvolio has got a lottery ticket. Lawrence Oliver, even in 1955, production directed by Gilgut was possibly the earliest to assure Puritan costume and obviously the lower class origin of Malvolio in a more socially realistic Illyria. So Malvolio is always set in the context of the class and caste distinction that was prevalent not only during the time of Shakespeare but is also present even today. So Elizabethan and English audience after the Elizabethan period looked at Malvolio always as an upstart, either as a Puritan upstart or a low class, low caste upstart. In Act 1, Scene 5, when Malvolio enters with Olivia and other attendants, Feste is playing on his joke, and Feste, through his clever jesting, points out that Olivia is actually a fool. Olivia is strong enough to take the criticism. But in a playful mood, asks Malvolio what he thinks of Feste. Malvolio gives a strongly negative appraisal of Feste. Feste stands up for himself. Olivia urges Malvolio to continue. And Malvolio does, voicing his enmity even more. Olivia chastises Malvolio for being too self-involved and ill-tempered. She even says to Malvolio that he needs to see the world as less of a harmful, aggressive force against him not to treat bird bolts as cannonballs. Cesario comes and stands at the gate for the entry. Olivia favors Malvolio and sends him off to chase the young man away instead. Malvolio enters and says that the imputed young man at the gate will not leave. When Olivia asks him what kind of man is he, Malvolio's firm trite reply is that why of mankind, giving the first hint of Malvolio as one-sided secret admirer who is engaged always in this tussle against the other in Olivia's life in this eternal triangle of love. He is a self-appointed guardian of Olivia, self-appointed lover of Olivia, self-appointed protector and of course he romances with the idea of Olivia. Olivia is impressed by Cesario and asks him about his parentage and when he answers that he is a gentleman, Olivia falls in love at first sight with this man Cesario who is, of course, Viola in disguise. Olivia is very happy when she learns that this man is gentleman, this man is well-bred, this man has got good parentage, and she starts secretly cherishing love. When Cesario leaves, Olivia calls in Malvolio, not Maria, and directs him to chase after Cesario to give him a ring that she claims he left with her and to tell him to come again the next day when she will tell him why, why she is not the one for the duke. See Malvolio's innocence in this act. He goes there, chases, finds him, gives back the ring and never thinks of this man as the other person in his romance. Act 2, scene 3 presents the Midnight Masquerades and we find here Malvolio's moderation. He actually becomes a victim because of his attempt to moderate the night-long revelers. In Act 2, Scene 3, Sir Toby and Sir Andrew are carousing in Olivia's house late at night. They talk about the definition of late. After all, Toby points out, once it is after midnight, 
the time is early than late when first day the clown enters toby calls for them all to sing and then the clown decides to sing a song of love as per the request so he sings oh mistress mine where are you roaming the three men join in the song and maria enters and warns them that malvolio will be on his way to throw them out indeed malvolio enters shortly thereafter and berates them for having no consideration for other and the time but the men are not to be deterred they continue to sing shouting at malvolio and even sir toby lashes out at malvolio for being so seemingly virtuous malvolio realizes that he has no control over the men and so turns up to maria he tells her she should not be supplying the men with liquor and in front of him she does so after malvolio leaves the men desire revenge so maria tells them about a plan she has devised that will work on malvolio as he is so straight laced full of himself and a self flattered person she explains that she is good at making her handwriting look like olivia and she will write a letter in the handwriting of olivia forging it the men correctly guess that the letter will lead malvolio to believe that the countess is in love with him maria leaves and remember malvolio's caution she he leaves the stage with a reprimand that that he will be informing everything to olivia so as a counterbalancing act maria has already decided to punish malvolio because malvolio is has tried to discipline this night long revelry of the merry makers in act 2 scene 3 if the masters go mad what shall a steward do simply be mad and remain silent for john wayes malvolio the steward of olivia's household is prized by that lady and for his grave and punctilious disposition he is always admired he discharges his office carefully and in a tone of some superiority for his mind is above his estate at some time in his life he has read cultivated his mind with books with the theories of pythagoras concerning the trans transmigration of the soul but he thinks more nobly of the soul and so and so he approves the opinion of others even so his own transmigration and transcendental romanticism does not succeed in the play his gentility though a little rusted and obsolete is like a sunday suit according to the critic which nobody thinks of rallying he wears it well and his mistress cannot afford to treat him exactly as a servant in fact in fact she has occasionally dropped good natured phrases she has always almost admired malvolio which he has interpreted into special partiality towards him and of course like don quixote he conceits can run riot inside his mind and he is a dreamer a romancer with his own dreams charles lamb also noted that malvolio i quote is not essentially ludicrous but that is morality and manners clash with the norms of the land of illyria according to charles lamb malvolio deserves some respect we see no reason why he should not have been brave honorable accomplished say this view is reinforced and lamb again points out that in the play this is reinforced at the end when the duke himself wants malvolio to live peacefully with the others charles knight had a similar reaction to malvolio he argued that the audience is meant to pity him but as olivia and the duke do at the end of the play we find that this reconciliation of malvolio to the fold is not possible because of his class standing the commentator john way suggested that we should have some sympathy for malvolio since since he has to live with the daily stress of sir toby sir toby is a guest in the household a kin we saw malvolio as shakespeare's device for showing what happens when a virtue becomes a vice or rather a virtue is forced to become a vice by the vice of other characters so not every critic agreed however arthur simons 
once wrote that Malvolio should be seen as comic, not tragic. George Brandes pointed out that Malvolio's believing that Olivia could love and desire him serves as a parody to the Duke and Olivia's own follies in love. See, Olivia is the lady of the house, whereas Malvolio is the master of the household and is a master, a steward, a guardian to a great princess with dignity probably conferred upon him. Others respect him. So this respect is because of his age, because of his length of service, because of his sincerity, trustworthiness. Olivia at the first indication of his supposed madness declares that she would not have him miscarry for half of her dowry. See this class prejudice of Olivia. Does this look as if the character was meant to appear little or insignificant? Just a toy in the hand of Olivia and she is playing with this first time secretary Stewart. Once indeed she accuses him to face on his face. What? Oh Malvolio, you are sick of self-love. But of course with gentleness she says this and considering everything that is there in the situation. We consider that Olivia's reprimand is just a little warning to Malvolio. If she had not thought that this particular infirmity of Malvolio shaded some virtues of Malvolio, Malvolio might have rectified his error. His rebuke to the knight and his Scottish revelers, we can say that these are sensible and spirited. And what about the mistress? When we take into consideration the unprotected condition of Lady Olivia, so she must be protected against the arrogance, against the merrymakers, and against Sir Andrew Aguchik, who has been brought as a to be husband, a bridegroom to be appropriated to Olivia just for money. So there is some secret regard with which her state of the real or the dissembling mourning should draw the eyes of the world upon her house affair. Malvolio protective, Malvolio is protective, Malvolio might feel the honor of the family in some sort in his keeping, as it appears not that. Olivia had any more brothers or kinsmen to look after. So Sir Toby has dropped in. And what is Sir Toby doing? Just drinking, merrymaking, and in his drunken revelry, shouting a lot in the dead of the thick night. According to Charles Knight, if we laugh at Malvolio, we laugh not to just laugh ill naturally, for the poet has always conducted us that he is uh, object of uh, ridicule because of the mischief that is played against him. And therefore he is a comic character in the play because other characters who also contribute to the making of the comedy play on the shortcomings of Malvolio. And of course these are also the shortcomings that are visible in the characters like Orsino, Viola, Olivia. So Malvolio's character can also be seen as Shakespeare's parody on characters like Orsino, whom he could not, of course, parody because Orsino is the Duke of Illyria. Whereas the Duke cannot be parodied, we have the parody, we have the criticism, we have the ridicule. We laugh at Malvolio instead. So there is no real malice at the bottom of the fun against Malvolio. So the reorientation of, Mal of Malvolio within the fold of comedy that is rich in realism as well as romance cannot be simply cancelled out. But this doesn't happen in the play. It is the rigid disciplinarian who is placed in the world of misrule, a world of carnival and caricatures. Tension between Malvolio and Feste can be seen in the play. Malvolio never finds him entertaining. He calls him Baron Rascal. These words will come back to haunt Malvolio when this same feste will appear as a topaz, punishing him in the dark chamber. And feste invokes a real gig of time to bring in his revenges. So feste's revenge is accomplished while Malvolio leaves the stage, promising to revenge on the whole pack of feste and his companions. What is set up in this exchange in Feste and Malvolio's first scene is a professional battle for attention and approval of the lady of the house. Will she follow a Malvolian, Malvolian regime 
of repression of discipline as she has done since the death of her brother or will she simply let her participate in the world of carnival and the hilarious comedies and farce played at the thick of night and as we see her she is well attended always protected by malvolio and even in her first appearance olivia's first appearance we have malvolio standing by her side or else will she allow herself to respond to the potential in the wit displayed by feste in the same scene which encourages her to leave off her too protracted mourning by point pointing out his irrationality significantly we find that in the play malvolio is absent from the stage when olivia first meets cesario he is thrown out sent out and this personal metamorphosis of romantic heroine a uh, heroine who was actually mourning the death of her brother for seven long years just plunges into love and romance at the sight of this young handsome man cesario it is arguable that malvolio represents not only a kind of puritan but also a figure of the absent father or brother who would normally control the behavior of the woman of the household so like portia's father who is absent and yet portia is playing on with the game of caskets in the merchant of venice here we have malvolio is always present and when olivia is planning to enter or plunge into matrimony she must have a malvolio to approve so he is sent with a ring to return it to cesario for teachersly he is the best and the most powerful male in the house a house too populated by idiots and drunkards and in this house he normally runs with his purse with his strict command and the young woman who has no husband who has no father who has no brother simply surrenders herself and allows this head of the household the holder of her purse string to govern so malvolio's ambition malvolio's desire to become the count of the house is of course there malvolio's professional desire for control is evident in his ineffectual protest in act 2 scene 3 that reveals his personal investment so he believes that he is right he is right the appropriate mate for olivia and all the others who are just chasing olivia are either fools or are mad lunatics like orsino so it is all fortune it is all fortune in the famous letter scene malvolio will be saying maria once told me that olivia olivia did affect me and i have heard myself come thus year so malvolio's romance is uh, actually planted in his mind by maria who once said told him that olivia did affect him and that she should fancy if she should be one of my complexion besides we have seen in the play malvolio is treated by olivia with utmost care so malvolio says that she uses me with a more exalted respect than anyone else that follows her so this is like sinking sinking drinking water for malvolio and definitely he will be dreaming love and love malvolio is presented as a spoil sport of the festival of 12th night 12th night the candle mass festival is a festival of cake and ale of drinking singing dancing of merry making and dreaming but in this he restores order so toby belch for example as a literal embodiment of this good life boldly pleasure epicurean life represents an alternative idea of virtue represented by the puritan malvolio he gives it a more generous epicurean meaning at the end of the very first scene encouraging sir andrew to dance he cries it is a world is it a world to hide virtues in when malvolio reproves his rustering at the thick of night sir toby replies indignantly hey dost thou think because thou art virtuous there there shall be no more cakes and ales in the house remember yet perhaps the play's most disturbing line is that of malvolio's final exist exit in that scene that i will be revenged on the whole pack of you 
the repressive anti-life forces that Malvolio embodies remain a real threat to the play. Romantic optimism. But remember, the play also begins with a serious note when Orsino enters the stage singing a song. If music be the love of, if music be the food of love, play on, give me excess of it. He's also in his solipsistic love and plans to remember, remember, not forget Olivia for seven long years and cherish the love. Malvolio also cherishes the same love without expression because he does not have that power and courage, authority to express his love. And in the play, we have the Catholic European culture, the topos of carnival versus the Lent, again and again reasserted. Carnival or Mardi Gras was the period that immediately preceded the 40 days of self-denial of Lent, which in turn was relieved by Easter. So we have a kind of juxtaposition of the festival of Candlemas, the 12th night of Christ's birth, when with candles, the Christians wait for the arrival of, of Jesus, who is born in the stable, the 2nd of every, of every year. And with that, the, there is a reminder to the audience, the imminence of Lent. So if the Puritan Malvolio is the representation, representative of Lent, Sir Toby and his fellow roisters, with the creed of cakes and ale, symbolize a refusal of the self-denial required by this religious tradition. So they will not fast, they will simply feast and revel, while Malvoli is talking about fasting, repenting and of virtue. So virtue is not rewarded in Twelfth Night, rather it is the vice, the leniency of the carnival that is awarded at the end. Sir Toby gets his mate, Sir Andrew misses the opportunity, Feste gets his money and Maria gets Sir Toby. The revelers, the lords of the misrule, who disrupt the world of Olivia and win after the feasting days the final battle of love. Malvolio on the other hand is just kept outside this battle. He is not even allowed to participate in the battle in his best gear. Rather, he is forced to put on yellow stocking cross gartered with a smile pasted on his face to encounter an equally sad, love longing Olivia. In Act 2, Scene 5, where we have Sir Toby, Sir Andrew, and Fabian in the garden, the Countess's servants, they are all together in Olivia's garden. Maria arrives with the forged letter that will trick Malvolio. She tells others to hide. Since Malvolio is coming and she throws the letter into the path, Malvolio, though does not immediately see the letter, but talks to himself about the very possibility that Olivia does truly like him. And this loud soliloquy of Malvolio is heard by these tricksters hiding in the box trees. And Malvolio speaks, we hear his comments. And these comments are from those who are hiding most reactions are from them and the disgust is often expressed. Malvolio's imagined superiority over others, well expressed through words, always, almost dispute the territory of equality. Malvolio imagines aloud and what his life would be, would be when he is married to Olivia, when he becomes Count Olivia, Count Malvolio. He would dress in his velvet robe, call his many officers and leave Olivia asleep while taking care of Sir Toby. He would tell Sir Toby to behave properly. He must no longer be a drunkard and ask him why he spends so much time with Sir Andrew. The hiding man are of course, men are of course outraged upon hearing Malvolio mention them specially. After all this, Malvolio sees the letter that Maria has written. He picks it up and immediately assumes it is from Olivia, just as Maria reactions, Maria has planted the letter, he reads it in sections, even turns around, giving reactions after each. The letter writer starts by saying she is in love with someone, but only provides certain clues. 
certain letters M O I A, not the person whom she loves. Those hiding in the bushes are gleeful that Malvolio is falling for the trap. And again, we hear their thoughts as he ponders over the letter. Malvolio decides that since all the letters mentioned in the note are in his name, the writer must be referring to him. Malvolio continues reading the letter. He suggests that the lover should do since he is truly a great man. The letter writer says the lover should act as if he is above others and be hostile. So he decodes the letters MOIA and says that there should be consonancy, but there is none. And he finds the handwriting similar to that of Olivia, her very use, her very tease, her very pits. And then he simply moves into the content of the letter. Since he is truly a great man, the letter writer says the lover should act as if he is above others and be hostile to others. The letter also reminds him of her positive comments about his yellow stockings and cross gartering. Malvolio is happy, he is ecstatic, he plans to do so whatever the letter says. Shakespeare now throws another surprise for the letter is not finished. It says that the lover should smile and again Malvolio is happy to do so. Malvolio goes dreaming, goes out dreaming and thinking of that smile that he will enter into this chamber of Olivia with a smile on his face with yellow stocking and cloth carpet to impress upon her. As he leaves, the tricksters come together again and they, they come together to hatch the next part of the conspiracy. Now the conspirators are all impressed by Maria's craftiness. Both Sir Toby and Sir Andrew say that they like, they would like to marry Maria. She enters and they praise her. Maria explains that the countess actually detests yellow stockings and the fashion of cross gartering is totally detested by her. And now smiling at this state of her sorrow will be most offensive. This makes the trick even better. They cannot wait to see how Malvolio appears and behaves the next time he is with the countess. So in Act 3, Scene 4, we have the smiling Malvolio in yellow stockings, crossed out, gartered, smiling. This scene opens with Olivia's garden, where Olivia is in a lovesick frenzy in anticipation of Cesario's return. She asks Maria to get Malvolio, since he is a serious-minded person, well suited to her present disposition. Maria, however, says that Malvolio is seemingly possessed. Maria wants Olivia to prepare herself for seeing him, building up the sense suspense for the audience. Olivia simply says that I am sad, he is mad, let a sad person see a mad person and still she wants to see him. Malvolio arrives in full regalia but Olivia first notices and cautions his smiling. He says he could be sad if she wants, if his attire is what she prefers since the cross gartering obstructs his blood flow. Undoubtedly, this scene provokes much laughter from the audience. For Malvolio is pained and ridiculously dressed, yet still wildly smiling. It's a tight fitting garment that Malvolio himself detests. The two women keep asking Malvolio what is wrong with him, and he keeps reciting his lines from the letter that he thinks Olivia wrote to him. The comedy intensifies when Olivia asks, Will thou go to bed, Malvolio? She fears that he is sick. While he takes the question in a more positive way as a proposition and he says finally, finally a servant enters and announces that Orsino's gentleman has arrived. Olivia then tells Maria to have others look after Malvolio and she is concerned that no harm should come to him. So Malvolio is flattered by the care that Olivia is taking. Olivia and Maria exit leaving Malvolio on stage to himself. He surmises on how he must now be hostile to those who come to aid him. Just as the letter instructed, Toby and Fabian and Maria all enter and act as if Malvolio is quite unbalanced. Malvolio responds rudely and finally exists. exits. So we have Maria warning Sir Toby and Fabian that they must go after him and be sure the 
joke is not discovered. Toby devices a plan to have Malvolio bound and locked in a dark room, thinking Olivia will go along with it since she has already seen his seemingly mad behavior. Arthur Simon says that Malvolio is a Don Quixote in the colossal enlargement of his delusions. In the cruel irony of fate, we twist topsy-turvy, making a mere straw in the wind of him, an eminently sober and serious man of the clearest uprightness, unvisited by a stray glimpse of saving humor. So Arthur Simon says that Malvolio is a man of self-sufficiency, a noble person with noble quality, perilously near to self-complacency, and he has passed the bound without knowing it. So every critic, except Charles Lem, of course, looks at Malvolio as an imposter, as a transgressor, as a person who has trespassed the authority of the class rigid, class rigid European society. And therefore he is punished and the punishment of Malvolio is justified by that structure of society that always gives the hierarchical graded inequality and feudal hierarchy utmost importance. So Malvolio becomes a victim of this in the play. In Act 4, Scene 2, we find Malvolio confined in the dark chamber. The scene takes place inside Olivia's house. Maria instructs Feste to disguise himself as a curate and then goes to get Sir Toby. Sir Toby and Maria return and Feste speaks as if he is the curate Sir Topaz to Malvolio. Not much, not much earlier, Feste has spoken of things not being what they seem to be. Here he says things that are what they are. Although he, in actuality, he is not who he appears to be, for he is only pretending to be a curate. And Feste insists that Malvolio is mad. Sir Toby presses his craftiness. Malvolio is locked in a dark cell and can only, can only hear Feste. He cannot see Feste. Feste speaks nonsense, trying to make Malvolio feel that he is indeed mad. Sir Toby says that he must leave and tell Maria that the fooling must stop since he is in so much trouble with Olivia. Toby and Maria leave and Feste speaks as himself to Malvolio. Malvolio asks him for a paper and ink and light in order to write a note to Olivia. Feste insists that Malvolio is mad. Since Malvolio cannot see him, Feste speaks as himself and then as Sir Topaz, showing, him, showing himself to be the real performer, switches role from one voice to another voice and he assumes one role another role. Feste finally agrees to get a paper ink and light and he leaves. So in Act 4, Scene 2, we find the confinement of Malvolio. Just listen to these lines. Malvolio says, Sir Topos, Sir Topos, never, never was man thus wronged. And this comment is true. True. Because Malvolio has not done anything to be punished thus. So he shouts out, Sir Topos, Sir Topos, Never, never was man thus wronged. Good Sir Topaz, do not think I am mad. They have laid me here in hideous darkness. The audience know that Malvolio has not gone mad, and yet he has been kept confined in this dark cell, the chamber for the mad person. In the voice of Sir Topaz says, Why thou dishonest Satan? I call thee by the most modest term, for I am one to those gentle ones that will use the devil himself with a curse. Says thou that the house is dark. So naturally the house is dark. The room is, the chamber is dark. Malvolio says, yes, as hell, Sir Topaz. And then Malvolio says, reminds Sir Topaz, I am not mad. Remember King Lear also shouting? I am not mad, not mad. Oh, keep me in temper and I shall not go mad. So King Lear's attempt to restore sanity and Malvolio's attempt to prove that he is not mad is almost same. Sir Sapa says, I say to you, this house is dark. And then he says, the clown says, madman thou erst. And I say, there is no darkness but ignorance in which thou art, like the Egyptians in their folk. Malvoli again says, I say, this house is as dark as ignorance. The ignorance were as dark as hell. And I say, there was never a man thus abused. I am no more mad than you are. Make the trial, trial of it. 
make any questions ask any questions dr johnson viewed that this malvolio is the target target because of his pride because of his pride because of his ignorance and pride goes before his fall so dr johnson is also from his feudal casteist classist position is assessing malvolio as a imposter as an imposter as a person who is planning to transgress his authority and trespass into the feudal aristocratic fold by his plans of love act 5 scene 1 all the only scene in 12th night act 5 the last scene malvolio ends the scene with this famous speech i will be revenged on the whole pack of you while uh, talks about the captain who knows where her clothes are and she reminds orsino that that captain has been locked up at malvolio's instigation so offering another example of malvolio's apparent harshness what should malvolio do allow this captain to do whatever this captain wants no so malvolio must have been harsh to this man but while is complaining to orsino against malvolio olivia calls for malvolio festa and fabian arrive and fabian reads malvolio's letter to olivia again she calls for malvolio and while they wait she tells orsino to think of her as a sister and since she is married to sebastian vilas brother so olivia as a lover of orsino has now turned her into a sister and with malvolio as a mistress she says that they should have a celebration and the duke happy to hear this asks vila to marry him fabian enters with malvolio the tone tone now changes as both the duke and olivia refer to him as a madman and malvolio accuses olivia of doing him serious wrong malvolio shows olivia the letter that he thinks she wrote and she explains that maria must have written it so is maria punished in the play no maria is awarded and who marries maria it is sir andrew sir toby marries maria sir toby is a kin to olivia fabian to announces his part and toby's part in the trick so all the tricksters confess that they have played a part in humiliating malvolio so toby says that he has married maria first feste admits his part in the prank as well and says that he wanted revenge for malvolio is speaking against every time against him harshly about him malvolio yells that he will get revenge on all the all those who are involved and leaves the stage in shakespeare's time audiences must have laughed at malvolio's plight but some more modern audiences have felt sorry for him olivia olivia even says that he has been most notoriously abused and the duke says that peace must be restored and peace must be made with him what does it reveal about malvolio what is malvolio called back and reconciled brought into the fold no had he done so or seen no and allowed this man to remain in the in the household of olivia as a ruler or seen no we have seen that is totally ignorant he will be romancing with olivia all the time and olivia is totally ignorant about the purse strings of the house and the presence of sir toby with maria of course can spoil the entire duke dom and the rule of duke orsino so olivia's presence is a must in 12th night to make it happy but olivia does not allow malvolio to remain in the play at the end so in conclusion we can refer to this introduction by morris helvert who in the introduction says that the comic element in malvolio is actually more out of our reach then what they may be of it in shylock when the jew is a boggy acting inhumanly in the beginning that he may be inhumanly treated in the end so just take the example of caliban in the tempest caliban is perhaps more tragic than malvolio even more tragic than shylock but malvolio's sufferings are gratuitous there is assuredly nothing like them in comedy we are simply scandalized not simply tickled we fatally miss our sudden glory hazlitt also felt this difficulty as lamb did but hazlitt never confessed it was driven just to say that in a very halting defense if a poor malvolio's treatment 
is a little hard. Poetic justice is not done in the best way. Poetical justice in a play like Twelfth Night is not expected because poetical justice is totally devised by the justice affected on the stage by a writer who caters to the feudal class. The maltreatment, therefore, of Malvolio reveals the shortcomings of an artificial society built on the rigid systems of caste and class hierarchy. Malvolio has been abused, has been infused with certain bourgeois vices, bourgeois vices of modern society, and he is still wrapped, trapped in the erstwhile pride and prejudice of decadent feudalism. Is it wrong for Malvolio to cherish these values as virtues? Malvolio's final exit is almost revolutionary. Whereas Caliban says that I will follow grace, I will follow Christian grace, Malvolio does not. Malvolio does not get reconciled and with his trite comment he says that I will be revenged on the whole pack of you. So this disturbs the happy ending of the play. Twelfth Light, Twelfth Night ends with a grim reminder of the inevitable fall of the feudal order, especially of the monarchical order at the hand of the new Butchosi and the political class that will emerge during the Commonwealth period in the hand of Oliver Cromwell and after the execution of Charles I. So Malvolio can be seen as anticipating the changes that will bring back bring back that old, rigid, orthodoxical values of Christianity back into England against the feudal, decadent society. Thank you very much.